Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at the British L1A3 bayonet for the L1A1 SLR, which was the British version of the FAL. Now these bayonets were made uh, at RSAF Enfeld as well as uh, BSA, and they were issued from about 1958 through until about 1987 when they started to be replaced by the SA80 bayonets for the um, L85 or the L3A1 bayonets. Now the history of the um, FAL, so the SLR bayonets, the L1A3, it's a little bit interesting with all of the other uh, trials that went into the SLR for their bayonets. So initially in 1951, uh, the British were using the EM2 uh, rifle, which was a bullpup in uh, 0.280. And uh, everyone kind of wanted to standardize, NATO wanted to standardize on the cartridge and um, a lot of people were quite happy with the British 280. However, the US wanted a much more powerful cartridge being 762x51, which was eventually adapted, adopted. Now, when this uh, new NATO cartridge was adopted, the British had to move away from their EM2 and they had to adopt a new rifle and quick. So they had a good partnership with uh, Belgium at the time and they adopted the FN FAL uh, as the SLR or self-loading rifle. They had a number of trials for uh, the rifle as well as bayonets and um, there was quite a few different trial bayonets actually. Uh, so initially they were looking at a number nine style of bayonet with an attached flash hider. This bayonet looked ridiculous, was ridiculous, and it didn't function as either a bayonet or a flash hider very, very, uh, very well at all. It failed at both, essentially. Then they tried uh, trialing something similar to like a FN49 style of bayonet uh, with uh, sharpened sides either side. And they had both a short and long version, but again, this wasn't adopted, uh, which is a shame because this is a fantastic bayonet and would have been a great option. From there, they tried the uh, X2E1, which is essentially a foul type A bayonet, like we have here. I've got a couple of videos on these already. Check it out, it's a very cool bayonet. And they were just marked along the spine, X2E1. E I don't have one of those, I want one. It's just a Belgian foul A and they weren't successful either. Then they tried a shorter version without the um, the prongs on the uh, the muzzle ring. Essentially, it was like an Uzi bayonet, but um, not an Uzi bayonet apparently. And that was the X3 E1. Before finally they decided on the X4 E1, which is essentially what we have here. And that's like a uh, number five or number nine style of Bowie blade attached to a small uh, handle with uh, metal grips. So the winner was the L1A1 bayonet, and that was adopted on the 1st of March, 1957. However, it wasn't very long before they realized there was an issue with it. So I've got an L1A2 here. I'll use that for comparison to explain the issue with the L1A1. Now, they found that when they were dealing with uh, riots, uh, riots, crowds, uh, civilians, um, Having the bayonet fitted to the rifle, it wasn't too difficult for someone to reach forward, press the button, remove the bayonet, and run off with it. I don't know if that ever actually happened, but that was a concern. So as you can see here with the L1A2, we have a protruding press stud. So on the 30th of December, 1958, a modification was uh, proposed and accepted for the L1A1 and the L1A3 uh, was born. And, um, the major modification is the press stud here has a recess milled into the side of the pommel. So it's a bit more difficult to press the uh, the button and remove the bayonet. The other modifications were the screw here in the pommel was slightly shortened. Another hole somewhere in the pommel was deleted. I'm not sure exactly where that is because I don't have an L1A1 to compare. And uh, yeah, I think that was about it. The um, L1A1 and L1A3 both have a uh, brazed and heat shrunk pommel onto the tang. Whether the L2, L1A2 and L1A4, like I've got here, uh, are riveted. You can't really see it. But we've got a rivet here and a rivet here. You can make that out. 
Now, while the British were using the L1A3, Australia and Canada uh, were using the L1A2, which as I've already discussed is exactly the same, except uh, the pommel is, instead of being um, braised and heat shrunk uh, on, it's riveted. And they were both making them domestically. In Australia, they were called the L1A2. There's a completely unmarked. And in Canada, they're called the C1. And uh, they are marked, but they have a blade in the white that's not blued or parkerized. Now, in the uh, mid-1960s, the Ricassos on the L1A3s were actually shortened. So, sorry, not the Ricasso, sorry, the Fullers were shortened, so the Ricasso was lengthened. And the reason for that is uh, during the uh, tempering process, uh, it was found there was to be um, a bit of a weak point in the blade, so it was strengthened by having a uh, shorter fuller. Later versions after that um, also had a simplified cross guard. So... As you can see here, we have a cut moving in towards the muzzle ring on either side. That was deleted and it was just simplified. And um, in the 1970s, the L1A3 was actually replaced by the L1A4. Well, it wasn't replaced, they started producing the L1A4. And uh, that pretty much identical to what we have here, just uh, the way the pommel is attached is different. So as I said, uh, same with the L1A2, it's just riveted on instead of brazed and heat shrunk. But all that aside, we'll take a look at the actual construction of the blade and it's very, very nice. It is actually quite small. Um, I'm a tall guy, so probably not the best reference, but in my hand, it's a little bit small. My you know, pinky sits just over the top of the pommel. But we've got a Bowie style of blade, very dark blue, as you can see here. Uh, squared fuller either side of the blade, got a um, unsharpened false edge and a sharpened true edge. And then uh, very narrow ricassos. Now our cross guard here, we've got our muzzle ring at the top. As you can see, it cuts in either side, so this is the unsimplified version. And then we've got a hole drilled in the bottom here, which I can only summarize as uh, for weight. I don't know if maybe it's a utility, so you can tie it to a stick to make a spear like the um, Jet Pilot Survival Knives, but hey, that's just a guess. And then we just have our metal grips that are riveted on, and our pommel, as previously discussed, heat shrunk and uh, brazed on, with our press button and a Mortise. This is quite difficult to uh, show off camera with my lighting, and the screw at the end of the pommel there. And moving down to the scabbard, it's essentially just a number five style of uh, scabbard, the same as what you have on the um, number five jungle carbine bayonet and the number nines. Uh, the major difference is that the throat is a uh, black metal instead of brass. Other than that, it's pretty much the same drainage hole down the bottom. And then we've just got a standard green frog. This one's actually original. We've got the broad arrow. 1984 stamped in there. Um, it's actually coming up pretty well on camera. It's very difficult to make out in real life. Cool. Now I'll jump into the markings and there are a lot of markings on these and they can be incredibly <laughs> confusing to the uninitiated. I had to spend um, a good hour or two trying to get my head around them. So um the first marking you'll come across well the first one i'll start with is the small one we have here on the handle and what we have is l1a3 being the bottle of bayonet followed by the nsn or nato stock number now the nato stock number changes depending on which bayonet it is so each of the uh, l series has a different nato stock number i should probably also point, point out that l stands for land forces now this one is 9600257 and it has a B after it. So that stock number means it's an L1A3 and the B is an abbreviation for BSA, being the manufacturer. Then we also have broad arrows, which have been electro penciled into nearly every piece. Um, I'll try to find a really prominent one to show you. There we go, there's one right there. And we've got another one down the back here. We've got one on the Ricasso. They've been electro-penciled all over this thing. Quite often they're stamped in as well. 
And after the NSN, sometimes you'll also find a, a date being two numbers like 59 or 65 or whatever, and that's the date of manufacture. Now, moving down to the Ricasso, this is going to be very difficult to show on camera because it's a very, very fine marking. So I may have to take photos and show you, but I'll take it off camera so I can explain what it is. Oh God, even off camera, I'm struggling to see what it is. I've got a B61. So B is, again, the manufacturer of BSA, and 61 is the year of manufacture, 1961. Now, the different manufacturer markings you can have, uh, BSA will have B, Enfield will have a um, an Enfield D, so it'll be a D with like a little E in the middle of it as well. And um, Hopkinson, who manufactured the L1A4s, from the uh, 1970s onwards. Theirs are a, a bit different. So they'll have an SM before the NSN, and then after it, they'll have a diamond with a H in it. And then on the Ricasso, uh, sorry, not the Ricasso, the Pommel, they'll have an R with a, and a C, both in circles. Um, yeah, I'm a little unclear exactly how the L1A forwards are marked. There seems to be a bit of um, variation. But, um, I'll jump in, oh, and they'll have a H on the Ricasso as well. Same as Enfield, they'll have their, their D with the um, E inside it on the Ricasso. But I'll quickly go into the different NSNs for the different models. So if you come across an L1A1, the NSN number is 9600011. And you can actually come across uh, L1A3s with that stock number because some of the L1A1s were actually converted to L1A3s. And uh, the way they did that is they just milled out the recess in the pommel and modified them into L1A3. So it's not uncommon to find that. Uh, L1A2s don't have a NSN on the pommel. However, you can find L1A2s with one of the other ones on there because it's not uncommon for them to be damaged and have replacement parts from L1A3s, L1A4s and such. Uh, L1A3, which is what we have here, I've already discussed, 9600257, and L1A4 is 9602379. Uh, I hope I haven't confused you too much because um, it was quite confusing to me when I was reading it. Uh, I got most of my information for this video from Ian Scanton and Richardson's uh, book, British and Commonwealth Bayonets, and that's a great source of information, but it's not always laid out in the best manner so jumping forwards backwards and forwards and pages is a bit difficult to get my head around it anyway guys i hope i've done this bayonet justice today um if you've enjoyed the video give us a like uh, if i made any mistakes or you have any further information i'd love to hear from you comment below and thanks for watching